the evening found Adam snuggled up in his bed whilst his mother sat close by in her rocking chair, repairing some of his torn clothes. There were only two rooms in the house. The back room was where his parents slept. This was also reserved for a storage space for all the stuff his father hoped to be able to sell on the market. And at special times of the year, like birthdays and Yule, these boxes would be piled up in corners and the bed would be folded up and packed away in a wardrobe-like device on the wall and the room would become the parlour. At the front of the house was the kitchen. The sink had a curtain round it for when people were washing. And this was also Adam's bedroom. Every night he would go to bed cosy and warm, and so sleep and dreams would come to him easily. And because of this, the contrastingly spitefully cold mornings never bothered him, for he was always so eager to get up out of bed and fit in a few adventures before school. Adam was probably only seconds from being asleep, drifting in that cotton wool complex of corridors, when he heard the front door slide open and felt the gasp of winter air, bringing with it the warm scent of cigar smoke. However, he made no effort to advertise that he was awake. Instead, he kept his eyes tight closed and cutched down into the blankets, eagerly awaiting the sound of his father's voice. The exchange between his parents was politely hushed, so as not to wake him. Then he became aware of eyes turned to him. Or perhaps he only remembered that sensation when looking back on this memory afterwards because of what came next. His father's deep, theatre tab's velvet voice, observing quietly. He really is a good-looking boy, isn't he? These words meant the world to Adam. All the bright, bubbly, fuzzy, sugary, chameleonic world. For a man who measured the value of everything by its prettiness of appearance, and to a boy who already knew that, though he did not quite understand it. That was quite the expression of love. And Adam did love his father so much, and he longed to please him. It was his life's ambition. To him, a piece of homework was never worth handing in until his father had smiled and said, that's good. A piece of... a, a, a joke was never worth repeating until it had made his father grin. Oh, rapture if it brought on a laugh. A song was never worth singing until he sang it at Yule, and his father had given his approval. And the universe was incomplete if it was void of the hope that one day he could have a mutually sober conversation with his father. But it was clearly going to take more effort than Adam yet had in him. So much so that he wondered if sometimes he tried a little too hard to be liked. Staying at a distance from his father and waiting for him to bring his affection to Adam in his own time seemed the right thing to do. But he did so long for this wonderful man to like him. Adam was never quite sure why there was so much of a difference in his parents' attitudes towards him. But it was evidenced, mainly, in the contrasting degrees of his involvement in their work. His mother worked four nights out of seven as a nightclub singer. And recently, Adam had been deemed old enough to stay up late and watch her. One of his earliest completely formed memories was of her singing while she was cleaning in the kitchen. And he felt so, so proud these days to watch her upon that stage, sparkling and shining with dignity, like a silver, sequin-clad angel, glittering in the candlelight, and resting on clouds of cigarette smoke. So proud that he knew that voice so well, that that was the voice that sung to him to sleep with lullabies, gently corrected his mistakes as she taught him to dance, and frequently told him off for staying out late past supper time. Whenever she had finished her set and had graciously thanked the band, the very first thing she would do was head to the table where Adam was sitting and give him a loving embrace. When his father was lost in the shadow of a peacock's wing, however, fresh from tumbling in off the stage, it was a very different story. Oh, there was no doubt that the pride was still there. Adam loved to hide in the shadow of the wings and watch his father there upon the stage, his heart was fit to burst with joy and honour, even just at the thought of it. Giovanni, Lorenzo, Arlecchino, the great actor, my father, commanding the emotions of his audience, having them rolling in the aisles and then reducing them to silent tears, 
combining his roguish beauty and sparkling wit with an impeccable talent for spontaneous comedy and ingenious comic timing. And all of that was besides his passionate excitement at being in the theatre among actors. And yet there was always a gravy stain of sadness. That salty hope unfulfilled. That when his father breathed in off, off that stage, he might, just once, notice that Adam was there. He didn't even have to say anything. Just a smile. Or even a look would do. Before, or even after, he fell into the words of his adoring fans and fellow players. Maybe if Adam could ever find himself as tall and as handsome and as cuttingly witty as his idol, this deep longing would be met. He was not yet of an age where giving up hope was an option. Now that he became aware he was alone in the room, he decided to take the opportunity to sink into a bath of nice thoughts about stars and fields of multicoloured grass tickling the summer skies. He imagined the stars might be something like big candles when you got up close to them. But he'd never really seen stars, except in picture books. The sky was always too misty to see clearly above the atmosphere. But he often liked to picture himself somewhere clean and new, gazing up at, at the myriad of colours, or a blanket sprinkled with confetti, or a snowstorm of little silver dots. Sometimes he'd climb to the top of the tenement to glimpse through the mucky window and see the golden lights of the houses in the neighbouring cities. It wasn't quite the same, though. Children on other worlds were so lucky to be able to see the stars. And he imagined that no matter what planet you were on, there would never be anything quite as wonderful as looking up and dreaming about the others. But then... There were billions of worlds beneath those stars that he intended one day to touch. His favourite set of books were the Narnia series, and he often wondered if C.S. Lewis had dreamed up all he wrote about, or if there really were places like he talked about in his books. From the introductions he wrote, the planet Earth and a place called England sounded much the same as Goonigan, but the places his ta characters tumbled into sounded anything but... Were there really creatures such as fauns and centaurs who foretold the future and badgers who could talk? Was there really such a thing as the cold purity of snow that blanketed a land in winter? Snow. Were there really places of greens and blues and yellows and purples where the air was sweet and fresh and people all said nice things to each other? Were heroic deeds really done to save those other worlds? And did ships really sail on water? And if, if, as touched upon in the first book of that series, dust could really travel between worlds, then why couldn't a living, thinking boy? But it wasn't just fiction that fed his hopes. There were the stories stole, told by the space sailors in the pubs he wasn't supposed to go into. A lot of those stories were full of words he didn't really understand. But they always sounded most exciting. And though the sailors weren't really interested in lovely depictions of shapes and colours of lands, they did talk about smells and foods and alien bodies, and there was always the subtext of naughtiness and danger, and a general feeling of not being tied down to anything or anyone. It must be lonely not to have a family to come home to. But Adam so longed to live so many stories to tell the family members that he did come home to. One day, when he got a little taller, and his voice got a little deeper and more powerful, he planned to pack his bags and fly to where he had no idea, but it would be an adventure. Maybe Robin would want to come with him. That thought brought him back into the bed in which he was lying, but he didn't seem to mind. It had him thinking again about school and the theatre and Yule. Everything of that sort suddenly seemed to have a fresh new lease of life, as if suddenly... A bridge had been formed between his dreams and reality, and the latter was feeding off that beautiful energy. It was as if, for the first time, he could actually see what he wanted as a real, real, grown-up possibility. 
That made all of the other things in his life now, school, theatre, Yule, seem even more exciting as well. A little tremor of merriment passed through his chest as he thought about the approaching Yuletide. It was actually very easy to get excited about the fall of the White Witch, the arrival in Narnia of Father Christmas, and all the presents the children were given, when this Christmas sounded very much like the Goonigan Yule, a period of great feasting and joy just before the spring began to appear. At any time of year, the house was always full of people, mostly women, his mother's friends and her sisters, who would sit gossiping, nibbling pink wafer biscuits, and sipping tea with their little fingers deliberately extended. But the population explosion was never more so than at Yule. For a whole two weeks, neighbours and family members would be traipsing in and out, and all were made welcome. All through the day and all through the night, there seemed to be a warm, heavy scent of much laboured over home cooking. And at this time, his mother would indulge in some extravagance. It could be chocolate. And she would serve at the table the meat of various birds, with many sharp or creamy fruit garnishes. There seemed never to be a time of day you couldn't see a drunken auntie snoring in a corner, or some red-faced uncles quarrelling about who would won the game of happy families. Brightly coloured paper hats slipping down upon their ruddy and ridiculous faces. The rooms would shine and glimmer in the candlelight, decorated with paper chains and boughs of evergreen plants. For well he remembered his cousins, Susie and Lorraine, trying to kiss him under the mistletoe. When they, when they had started to cry, because he wouldn't, he felt so bad about running away that he felt he simply had to go and say sorry. At that point, they had both taken their hands away from their dry faces and planted a smacking kiss upon each of his cheeks, and then skipped away, giggling wickedly with triumph. Actually, it hadn't been quite as unpleasant as he had feared. Adam wondered whether Robin would be willing to suspend her hostility towards the adult population in the spirit of the season and come round to play at Yule. He was sure he could persuade her, and he was sure his mother would like her. He, he was always allowed plenty of friends around, and Robin wasn't really all that different. Well, she was. He just couldn't figure out why. Adam then found himself wondering what it would be like if Robin lived in the house with him forever, and for the first time in his life, he found himself visualising what he would be like when he became a man. He didn't understand exactly how it worked, but something seemed to happen to children at a certain age that made them no longer children, but taller, wider, and angrier. He had never much liked the idea of that happening to him. But something about Robin, something totally inexplicable to his childhood mind, had changed all that, and it made him determined, it seemed, to climb every single mountain of emotional and physical development that posed, and to scream out with joy at their peaks. Naturally, he pictured his father, but blonder and skinnier as Adam was, and purple eyes instead of china blue. Robin, as a grown-up, simply looked like the elongated version of her current self. Would they be like his mother and father? He wondered. Really, he thought he was more like his mother, and Robin was more like his dad. He knew that he and Robin would probably argue all the time, as they did now. But it never meant anything. Though neither of them realised it, arguing was simply their love language. As long as they continued to argue about interesting things, like the afterlife, the royal family, entertainment, rather than rent and crumbs on counters, it would probably be very exciting. You see, Giovanni and Audrey never argued, either in front of Adam or in private. They were simply two people existing in the same environment. And though Adam would not understand this until many, many years into adulthood, and the past was a safe enough distance to be analysed, he already knew that if he found himself living with Robin forever, he wanted something much more exciting than a codependent coexistence. Tonight, it seems, was a real night for firsts. As now, for the first time ever, Adam found himself wondering if anyone was ever going to call him Dad. Was it inevitable? And you didn't get a choice about whether you grew up and had children. 
Well, he supposed, he did always love meeting new people. Admittedly, people who were younger than him, cousins and also his mother's friend's children, whom he often found himself having to play with, unnerved him a little, because he didn't like the idea of getting into trouble if anything went wrong. But then again, things were probably less likely to go wrong if Robin lived with him, along with these people who called him dad and called her mom, and if they looked at it as a partnership. He supposed he and Robin would have lots of things to do, grown-up, normally, things that grown-ups normally take care of, such as cleaning and working, but he supposed also that even those things would seem less bleak, like school seemed less bleak, if they had each other to play with when they chose. Obviously, they'd still have time to steal away for adventures, and maybe sometimes the little people would come along with them, or it would just be the two of them. He was certain now that whatever situation he found himself in, it would always be an adventure, so long as Robin was with him. Yes, Robin was most certainly as fundamental a part of his future plans as his parents were a part of his present. He would most definitely invite her round for Yule. Maybe not before then. He didn't want to annoy her again too soon. Or perhaps he began to wonder. He wasn't really ready to share her with anyone else just yet. <laughs>